Welcome to the deeper dig of the Illinois Fruit and Vegetable Newsletter, overseen by University of Illinois Extension Educators. These videos are meant to continue discussion from the monthly newsletter and sharing regional reports, updates on fruit and vegetable research happening throughout the state of Illinois, and highlight important tasks that growers should be considering during the month. My name is Graham McCarty, and I'm a local food and small farms educator with the University of Illinois Extension, serving Joe Davis, Stevenson, and Winnebago counties. I'm joined by Nathan Johanning. He's a commercial ag educator, covers Madison, Monroe, and St. Clair counties, and one of the editors for the Illinois Fruit and Vegetable Newsletter. How are you doing today, Nathan? Doing good, Grant. How are you? Oh, pretty good. You got some good weather that way? Well, uh, it's hot and sunny, I guess, if that's, uh, which is pretty good. Uh, we're just a little on the dry side, just a touch. We're borderline on kind of entering into that drought zone, so a little, little rain would be nice, but uh sunshine like everyone recently had lots of heat we've been uh, been flirting with in those 90s to 100 degrees for the last uh on and off for the last week or two so uh it's uh it's been a, a pretty toasty almost record-breaking uh june from those perspectives but uh but anyhow it's other than that things are going going pretty good but certainly crops are or crops that aren't irrigated or they're kind of searching for some water. As I mentioned to a grower the other day, it's like they definitely, any crops that are established have a pretty good root system on them. So yeah, pretty, pretty similar up north. We're, we're, we're pretty similar temperatures and, you know, we're kind of hit or miss here and there with the rain. Um, we're also joined by Bronwyn Ailey. Bronwyn Ailey is a local food and small farms educator who serves Gallatin, Hamilton, Hardin, Hope, Saline, and White counties. And she is the other editor of the Illinois Fruit and Vegetable Newsletter. How are things that far south, Bronwyn? Uh, you know, very similar to the rest, rest of the state. Um, feels like the last couple of mornings, the uh, humidity hasn't been quite as oppressive. So it felt like you could actually breathe for a while until about 10 or 1030. And then it was getting a little a little stifling, but um, uh, again, same. I don't. I think we may have picked up a uh, shower, um, kind of spotty in 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 the southeast Egypt region um, about seven days ago, and so there are some some pockets that got a little bit of rain that they needed, but then there's some that are would be more like what Nathan described that are, could really use a a shot of rain. So. Yeah, we kind of had the same thing. It was Friday morning, um, which had been about a week ago, and it came through. And I heard just from kind of even just in our county, just reports. I heard um, zero. I heard like a tenth and a half. I heard three tenths, and I heard six tenths. And, so, and it it was in you know across maybe uh, going north to south. I don't know, maybe twenty miles at most. You know that was kind of the dispersion. So. The, the six tenths probably lasted maybe a day or so, the tenth, maybe an hour or two, you know, that next morning. But uh, yeah, just uh, it's worse at that point with at that point, we had lots of, you know, 90s, but then we had a pretty good breeze with it and upper 90s. And so the air is actually reasonably dry. It's not this. It wasn't the super, super swampy, humid. It was just the, you know, close to 100 degrees, reasonably drier air, so to speak and a, a breeze and it just sucked the moisture out of stuff you know especially come afternoon you know the evaporation rates and stuff is just you know tremendous so oh yeah i mean i, I can completely understand that and, and, and really it, it's what we were encountering quite a bit up at, this far north as well it's just really unusual um and yet you know it's something that we maybe are consistently starting to see you know it's this period of of the you know We've just planted most of our field tomatoes or or any of that those summer vegetables Memorial Day weekend into the first week of June, and then you're just hitting it hard with these you know severe temperatures and a rain shower here or there, but nowhere near what the irrigation needs are with these plants. Um, and I don't think we've really had. I'd have to look back to see, but we haven't had like any widespread substantial rainfall for, you know, for multiple weeks. There's maybe been a few showers and there was I think maybe like a quarter inch in maybe, you know, three some weeks ago, but nothing, you know, nothing widespread and, you know, like even close to an inch. Um, and so when you couple that with, you know, these kind of uh, record breaking high temperatures, you know, that's, uh, that's really uh, just kind of tough. So. 
Well, one of the things that really makes the newsletter, you know, uh, important, and we've already spoken a lot to it already, is kind of giving a, an overview of the weather throughout the state. But it's these regional reports that really can help an individual who subscribes to the newsletter see what other growers are encountering in his or her region, or even, you know, five six hours away, like like we are. Um, so, you know, Bromwin, what has the growers in Southern Illinois really been dealing with this last month of June, and kind of where are things at with these fruits and vegetables that they're growing. Yeah, so I think for us, um, blueberries are are ripening, and so we see our U pick patches are opening up for for harvest uh, and also for pre pick. Um, same with some of the early season uh, blackberry varieties. I think they're starting to ripen. Uh, looked like uh, maybe Rendelman's had on, had posted that I think they're opening this this weekend for peaches. So early peach wow. crop is, is okay. um, ready to be harvested as well. Um, and I think uh, those with, I think we're, we're starting to see some tomatoes come in. I know our, we had our first kind of our first harvest on our, our tomatoes and our high tunnel, um, this last week. And so I, I think those are coming in. Um, uh, I, you know, it, it seems like, you know, everybody was, was late. I think growers always like to see if you can have sweet corn before the 4th of July uh, for us here in Southern Illinois. And, and I think this, uh, our spring weather really delayed planting on that. And so I, I don't know that we'll really have much sweet corn in before the 4th of July. Mm -hmm. There may be a few, a few areas that were dry enough to get, you know, a few patches in early, but um, I think that sweet corn planting was delayed a little bit that but that's kind of what we're seeing right now yeah and when is typical sweet corn planting uh for for southern illinois that far south um i mean i think we can see some growers you know looking at like that april 15th um trying to get some of those early early um maturity varieties in um, you have to watch the soil temperature still pretty cool so all right um, you know, you may plant and they may not germinate for a week or so, but it just mm. kind of depends on the season. Yeah, I think all the, you know, we had, we were coupled with really just kind of across the board, kind of cool weather. I mean, there was pockets of warm, but, you know, I don't remember when it was, but it seemed like forever before we even hit 80 degrees. Mm. Um, you know, I think it was getting close to May before we had, you know, a lot of, you know, any consistent, you know, weather like that. So, um so yeah that's it's it's just been unique and then kind of as i think some of us were kind of thinking as we kept not being warm it's like all right well the switch is going to go straight from kind of like early spring to summer and it pretty well had you know we went from you know we had a, a couple brief days of like nice maybe 80 degrees 70 80s but we had an awful lot of 60s to maybe 70 and then after a little bit we're 90 plus so we didn't have a couple months of 70s and 80s in between like you know like we like we would ideally like and, and think of so so are there any crops that are just truly thrown off at this place i mean you mentioned bromwin sweet corn but are there kind of any others that are going to be pushed back um much longer at this stage i don't know you know we talked about the delayed planting on the sweet corn but also um you know, if you're able to, if they're able to get enough moisture, these 90 degree days are really going to push that sweet corn, you know, so we may see some patches that can catch up and they may not be, you know, end up being that far behind in their, their window that they were shooting for. Um, I don't know, as far as any other crops that would, that are really going to be thrown off track. I'd, you know, I think growers that are that can get out on black plastic are going to, you know, that would have helped some things, too, because um, then you can, you know, you're providing supplemental irrigation at that point. And, you know, if you if you were able to get your beds made, you know, that black plastic will help, you know, heat the soil up. So some of those uh, crops would have still been able to get in in time in this, this spring. So I think with some of the you know, with some of the cooler conditions, I think it made a little more of a struggle. And I think, you know, plant growth earlier on was was definitely slowed. But I just in seeing what's coming in, I feel like we've been able to rebound and recoup just on like the annual summer vegetables and stuff. They, you know, a lot of our the are really innovative growers that are really, you know, pushing, you know, diverse markets and trying to get, you know, everything they can as early. I think 
I think they were able to sneak in some stuff. I don't know that it's huge amounts, but I mean, I'm seeing, um, you know, certainly, you know, lots of, you know, summer squash and, you know, and some tomatoes starting to trickle in out of high tunnels and, and, and some beans and other things. So there's some stuff got in, but it certainly wasn't, um, especially small scale, but, you know, as far as, you know, having big windows of opportunities for getting stuff in, it was, it could be kind of narrow, so. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, that's certainly what we, we kind of notice uh, up in our region of the north. It's like there's, there's a short window and, you know, it might be possible to get some of those things in early, but for some of the things you, you're, you know, as, as you've mentioned, Nathan and Brana has mentioned, like, we don't have the irrigation. If the soil temperatures aren't where they need to be, it's really not going to make much difference waiting for a period of time. Um, and certainly what we've noticed is we, you know, if you have any cool season type of crops that's more uh, prone to bolting, they've bolted. They have already sent up seeds. Like, so those precious broccoli plants or anything that maybe were started indoors and, you know, took forever to get into the soil, they didn't develop ahead this spring because the temperatures went straight into the 90s for a week of, of May and certainly the first couple of weeks of June. And it's gotten that way, too. Um, I think the one crop that we know noticed this year that did not perform and there won't be really yields is tart and or sour cherries. The, the flowering period for them just wiped them out and they flowered towards the end of April and then were really uh, more noticeable the first week of May. That was time with temperatures in the 90s. So that was completely wiped out. Um, you know, we, we have a sour cherry tree here at our Rockford office and, you know, most years it survives the winter, it survives the cold springs, it produces what feels like buckets and buckets of sour cherries. You walk out there today, there's a half a cup of cherries, if that, on that tree. Um, so that's just one noticeable crop that we won't have this season, really. Uh, when when I uh, I went to the uh, Summer Hort Field Day in, on June the 9th that was held at Eckert, so down in um, Southern Illinois this year, and uh, part of the program they had some of the different growers uh, within the Illinois Hort Society come up and just kind of give a kind of an overview of how their se season was going so far and it seemed like there were multiple growers that mentioned uh, that they felt like their their crop was a little bit light and nothing was was completely gone but a little bit light in some some of the uh, the tree fruit because of the weather conditions that we had during pollination and mm. so um you know, and that was varied throughout the state. You know, we heard from southern, extreme southern Illinois growers, and then you know, more more central Illinois growers, um, and and I think maybe even a northern Illinois grower mentioned that. And so, um, you know, the weather conditions during pollination they felt had had an effect a little bit on on their crop. Again, nothing was. No one mentioned that they were going to have a, a crop loss, um, but just a little bit smaller crop uh, on a on a few of the varieties than normal. Yeah. And I would say, you know, and I should also say sour chart cherries, we don't see it on a large scale commercial production side. We see that, you know, a grower, an apple orchard will probably have some of those trees and they'll just be kind of another opportunity to get into the market. But it also, yet again, is a reliable one. And I think that that's where it's been a very um, uh, unfortunate that that reliable crop that they have every year is not performing as it should. Um, how how's this last month been for you, Nathan? What are growers encountering? Is it kind of similar to kind of what we've talked about, or are there some unique challenges that your group is facing? I mean, I think some of the biggest thing was uh, there was a, a while whenever you really wanted to be out in the field, like trying to get good soil conditions in some field, depending on how they laid, um, you know, getting soil conditions to work ground and 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 stuff at that point was hard. And then it kind of suddenly turned off pretty dry. And we had, um, we had a situation, um, I, you know, you work something hard or that was a little bit too wet. And then, you know, we hit that very first spell where we hit up into the nineties or close to hundred degrees and it like turned stuff into bricks. Like mm. I had some, um, some trials for a, a, a demonstration project for a summer camp with some different sweet corn and, and uh, I planted some of that and that was the cloudiest 
um I, I didn't even I mean, it actually worked out fine, but, um, you know, but it was, I, I was not particularly, you know, you know, pleased with, you know, how, you know, how things had come together, but, um, but, uh, you know, we did at that point, we caught a little rain and then that kind of mellowed it out. And then, you know, we've since put in other plantings, just kind of did like a stale seed bed and went in and, and put plantings in over that. And it's, they've done, um, and they, and they've done well, even that initial stand, I mean, the stand came up really well um but um but yeah that was uh the, yeah the, the soil conditions getting good soil conditions on some of those when you're trying to squeak in those early plantings now if you had held out a little bit yeah it would have but you didn't know is it going to rain again you know where's your window you know you're kind of a cat and mouse game with the the weather and so um so i think that was probably one one kind of challenge um kind of side on your your tart cherry note we do we have, we have a few tart cherries and actually had I'd say an okay harvest. Um, usually that always in right around on time came right around Memorial Day is mm -hmm. harvest for us and down here. And that's, uh, we had a few storm systems that came through maybe a week or two before harvest, just some strong winds and knocked a lot of cherries off. And so the crop from then was kind of light, but uh, but decent overall. Uh, we were able, you know, flowering stuff was able to dodge any frost or cold threats uh, for the most part, but um but yeah it's certainly even there it can be kind of a hit and miss on uh, on weather and things but no um i think that's the biggest thing you know a lot of growers you know have planted or are planting pumpkins uh, i think a lot of them are probably in the ground and uh, a lot of them and if not soon to be so what's the uh what are the tasks during the month of june for pumpkin planting once it's already been planted you know what are what are growers looking at these next say month of the first or the next six weeks so uh a lot of it um you know obviously you know the planning time frame you know we have you know of our you know most you know guys looking at some form of like a pre-emergent herbicide spray um i think from at least the phone calls that have come in some of them what they're looking in is uh weeds that they didn't control uh whenever they spread they either did or didn't spray a pre-emergent or had weeds that escaped the pre-emergent so i've had calls from all over on um you know i have uh, my pumpkins are up but i have water hemp i have velvet leaf i have in some cases you know johnson grass other things what do i do um there's a couple there's at least some of those have some solutions there's a couple of things that there's just not there's just not a lot of good good solutions i and i tried to reiterate some of that in an article in in the last newsletter from may is just you know if if you're looking at the herbicide programs you know pre-emergent herbicides are are just crucial if that's your plan if that if that's your your mode especially in no-till or even just in conventional tillage um you know that's where we have the the most power to control like broadleaf weeds if you don't get good rain if you need to do everything right and you don't get the rainfall needed to really activate those herbicides or some weeds you know come up before that um then um then you can have problems and and their your options become extremely limited i've had a lot of um you know your best option is a is some banded applications between rows or cultivation you know that's kind of what people are down to for some weeds especially water hemp um there's a we have a few selected broadleaf options if you have just the right weed that comes in um but but boy it's well really it's sandia is the, is the main the only post-emergent broadleaf herbicide we have and it has a very narrow window maybe a few things like cockleburr velvet leaf uh mm -hmm. nut sedge wow. um but if you don't but other than those you're up it's it usefulness is fairly limited there's a few others but it, it's fairly narrow in the in what it will control so mm. gosh yeah I, I know one of the things that oh, we'll talk about this later today but um with this day neutral strawberry um project when we're looking at post-emergent herbicides for it for um uh, for control of weeds, there's very few because the PHI for so many post-emergence is 30 days. And, you know, with these day neutrals, they're going to start yielding potentially in 30 days or even less than that. So it's like what we were encountering is that we're trying to figure out what oversides are available, recognizing there's not many, but also recognize that next year with our study, we're just going to have to be more on top of it because of these PHI. 
and really that will be a pre-emergent most likely i would say yeah there's um yeah in in anything with a really short turnaround then that a lot of time then that leads a whole nother area of of options pumpkins are are pretty good in that most of our product we don't well, of course we don't have many products that are post-emergent and most of the time because they do vine and form a canopy usually we're trying any sprays are going to be early in the season um, because that's when they're really targeting and then if we get if things will stay clean even for a month after that usually with good growing conditions of pumpkins most varieties will vine out and they'll pretty well they'll be able to fend for themselves at least most of the jack-o-lanterns some some gourds there's some things that don't provide quite the same level of canopy but most pumpkins compared to other crops um, do canopy and do a lot of their own work when if you can get them to that point so all right well another kind of part of the part of this video series is to really provide research updates for what's going around the state as most of us are engaged in research in different parts of the state this is a really great piece to kind of continue and show some visuals of the research that's happening this summer. Um, so Bronwyn, uh, would you like to kind of kick us off and I'll share some of the photos that you've provided? Yeah, sure. All right, so looks like a high tunnel, huh? <laughs> yeah, looks like a high tunnel. So yeah, this is uh, one of three high tunnels, uh, commercial size high tunnels that we have at Dixon Springs uh, that we're doing research in. Um, this would be our, our middle high tunnel, the, uh, the oldest of the three that we have. And so in this tunnel, we, we have eight permanent raised beds. So you can see the, the, uh, the wooden uh, boards there. So those are our permanent raised beds. And within this tunnel, we have some indeterminate tomatoes, a few cucumbers. We have an observation, observational plots of tomato and pepper varieties that we're looking at this year. Uh, when we go to another picture, we'll see the replicated trials on that. But within this tunnel, we just had have one plot of each of the varieties um, just for observational purposes. We also have uh, the two rows in the middle are kind of a mix. We have, uh, I think, two different onions, um, some shallots. There's uh, three different types of three different types of celery. We've we put a little fennel out, some dill, some cilantro. Um, there's several different beets, some carrots, just random, random things there. And then the outer row on the right hand side is a row of, of cut flowers. Huh? Yeah. What kind and, of cut flowers are those? Uh, we have, you know, there's there are several different varieties in there. There's some zinnias. There's status. Um, we let's see what was new this year that we looked at. Um, we. We threw, we we tried some quinoa. Um, really? Oh. Yeah. Uh, I'm still. It's. I, I, I. It's not that impressive right there currently. Um, there's something called Job's Tears, which looks a lot like corn or grass. I mean, it's in the. It's obviously a grass of some sort, but it has an interesting the way its seed head forms. Is kind of interesting. So I think, as far as a cup in cut flower world, it would make a, a pretty unique um, filler in your bouquets. And there's some snapdragons and quite a few zinnias in there. Uh, I think, I think so when you're soil. trying out these different like cut flowers or different types of herbs and, and onions, you know, is it trying to kind of see what the market potential is with, with them? Or is there even more of a more of a production standpoint of trying to attract beneficial predators or something like that, I guess? So um, I think it, with the cut flowers, that's twofold. We're looking at um, what, what beneficials are we attracting into the tunnel with that cut flower row. Um, this, this tunnel um, with, with the different crops in it, um, even without the cut flowers, is a lot more diverse than the other tunnel that we'll see in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, and from last year's research with Dr. Athey on our biological insect control project that we're looking at when she was sampling the insect pests or just the insects populations in general in these tunnels this tunnel was a lot more diverse in the number of, of mm. different insects overall that were in this tunnel and so i think that cut flower row and and just the diversity of crops is is drawing more insects into this tunnel than the other one um, but as some of these things that we're looking at um 
and the the onions, the the herbs, the things. It's um, some of it's we just we're playing with it. What can we grow in the tunnel? That how does it how well does it perform um, within the tunnel? Uh, you know, we're the like the onions that we see in the very front of the picture. That's the uh, candy variety, which I think is pretty popular with growers. Um, it's a great onion, and you know it uh, it performs really well in the tunnel. Actually, I. I think um, the tops are all starting to brown up with the, and so it's signaling that it's ready to be harvested. So I think by next week that that section of candy onion is going to come out. So um, how early is that going to be compared to traditional field grown onions? Um, I'd say I would say a little bit earlier, but I think that most most folks are probably getting onions out by Fourth of July in the field as well. So um, we didn't plant this tunnel particularly early. Um, I think most things we set in here were around that April 15th, April 20th mark. Um, whereas typically we would have probably set like April 1st. So we were about two, two and a half weeks late in planting the tunnels this year from when we typically would. So. Um, but yeah, so this is this is the farm tech, and so diverse crops in here. As far as the biological uh, control project, um, this would be we we have our three commercial size tunnels, and then we have our smaller youth tunnel, and all three of the tunnels are involved in the project. So this particular pro this particular tunnel, um, the the predator insects that we're releasing to control, look at control of our pest insects are a timed release in that um, Dr. Athey comes down and, and releases uh, once a month in this tunnel. Okay. And so she actually did that last night. And uh -huh. uh, so in this tunnel, you know, we, we released uh, lacewing larva, um, aureus, a uh, minute pirate bug, and um, a predatory might uh, the Sporsky, which and those are all three kind of generalist. Um, you know, the lacewing is going to maybe target the aphids more. My neat pirate bug a little bit more on the aphid or on the thrips, um, but they're also just a generalist. Though, you know, if there's other creatures out there that they want to eat, they're going to go for them. Uh, and so that's that's the application or the treatment for this tunnel is a a, a monthly release. And so if we go to the next slide and the next picture, this is our other tunnel. Um, this would be the control tunnel um, of the th of the four tunnels. And so there are no predator insect releases in this tunnel at all. Um, we are we're gathering information on what insects are there. Um, if there happen to be natural uh, predators that come in, we're glad for it, but we're not making uh, we're not applying any insect uh, controls or uh, insecticide sprays to control our, our insect pests. Um, now, the caveat to that is if we have any worms, any caterpillars coming in, uh, which we've had uh, tomato fruit worm and hornworm coming in, we do make a, a BT application to control those. Uh, and that would be in, in across the tunnels. But so you can see this. Uh, Julie and Jennifer, we're, uh, I think we we're getting ready to harvest uh, earlier in the week from this picture. And in this tunnel, we have our replicated uh, tomato variety trial. We're looking at uh, 11 different varieties in the in that trial. And There's also 11 our, different varieties in there? Yeah, we've wow. got okay. um, four plant plots and uh, so in and, and four replications. So um, we do have on, again, this tunnel, there are eight permanent raised beds, and the two outer rows also have uh, bell, they have bell peppers in them, and th that's on a replicated variety trial as well. And mm -hmm. I can't remember how many different varieties of peppers we're looking at this year. Um, I feel like it's in that oh. nine to ten <laughs> This so is yeah, there are, uh, <laughs> there are 256 tomato plants in this tunnel, and uh, I think there's 200 and 40 something peppers. So, 
I don't know about you, Nathan, but this is, um, <laughs> I, I, <whew. laughs> you know, this seemed a like a really bit. good idea in February. We're like, let's, <laughs> let's just plant this all in tomatoes and put a replicated trial in. And then it's, yesterday as we were walking through, we're like, who thought of this? This is great. What are we it's, doing? It's, a, it's a lot of work. Um, that's what I'll say. Um, yeah, okay. I always felt like in like reminiscing, it does seem, you know, enjoyable, maybe not in the moment, but there was always some level of satisfaction with, you know, having some feelingly like ridiculous amount of, of, of yield that you can pull off of, you know, an area like this. And um, whether it be this or, you know, we had, you know, field trials of tomatoes last year that we were picking tomatoes and peppers, you know, literally out our ears. And yeah, it's, it's, mm -hmm. uh, there's some level of satisfaction that comes with the, the like blood set and tears it takes to make it happen. But yeah, you yeah. can see in the uh, kind of the, the bottom uh, left central section, that little yellow sticky trap, mm -hmm. little card, uh, we, we put those out. Uh, we change those cards out once a week, but Dr. Anthony collects those and they go back to her lab on campus and um, she has her lab go through and identify. Um, so this is this is one way to track what insects are in the tunnel, whether they're pests or predators. Um, and we put out about six of those per tunnel spaced out. And uh, like I said, that's, that's one of her monitoring techniques. She also comes down, oh, a week or two after a release, and we'll go through and um, check to see, you know, if the things that we have released are actually still in place. Um, you know, one of the interesting things about biological control, insect control, you know, they've done a lot of work with it in greenhouses that are completely enclosed because when you release those insects, they kind of stay put. Well, in a high tunnel, our sides and our ends can be open. We're venting those tunnels passively. So, you know, those insects, especially if they have wings, they may decide to go somewhere else. And so, how, you know, you can't really count on keeping them in place. And so I think there's a, a lot of different components to that research project that uh, information that she'll be able to kind of glean from once we finish this second year. So, right. so yeah, that's, uh, that's the tomato tunnel. <laughs> I will say it's always nice to have like a, like to Dr. Athey, just to send the yellow sticky cards for to have a lab to evaluate them because picking tomatoes is fun. Looking at insects on sticky cards sometimes is is just not like what you know, not quite as exciting as picking tomatoes, even when you're covered in green and hot and sweaty and it's 100 degrees in the high tunnel. So yeah, and just being able to kind of move through. I, I know like my tomato research in Tennessee was was similar with high tunnels and but we just had three varieties in that high tunnel so that's that's why it's 11 <laughs> it throws me off because I know how many bins are needed to collect and make sure that everything is uh, collected properly yeah and so we have we have um, four of the rows are devoted to the replicated trial and then there's another two rows that like one row is just solid mountain gem um, and then the other row um, I think we have we have um, a yellow variety a yellow variety of BHN the 871 mm. um, we have some red deuce we have some uh, BHN 589 and those are not included in the replicated trial um, mm. those I you know we know that those do well in high tunnels um, and put those in and then I had her put one, I had her put a variety in, um, it's, again, we kind of tell my age a little bit. In the old days of variety trials in the field, uh, there was one, a variety called Sunbright, and I always liked it. It was usually in our top five, um, and and Jeff Kindhearty used to tell me that the reason I liked it was because it was really easy to grow. It was, you know, it was an easy feeder, and, you know, it didn't take a lot of effort and he's like that's why you like it because it's I'm like I like it because the flavor is good and um, I think it it you know performed pretty well so I had her we, we stuck about 11 or 12 sunbright tomatoes mm. plants in there as well and uh, it's interesting it's a lot more rough than I remember I think some mm. of our our more our newer varieties that we see now that we're used to um, they may have a touch of a rough shoulder but for the most part they're really smooth and oh, you know, okay. looking like like uh, 
Sunbright's got a pretty rough shoulder. Not cracking bad, but it's just pretty rough. But and that's nice. more to its genetics that's giving yeah. that rough shoulder? Okay. Yeah. So, um, so on these two pictures, I think the one on the left, um, I think probably took that a week and a half ago or so, uh, walking through and just kind of going, oh my goodness, there's a lot of fruit on that first cluster. Um, and, you know, at that point, Julie and I were like, yes, weird. This is, you know, this is awesome. This tomato crop looks great. And then the one on the right is right before we harvested earlier in the week. And as you can see, um, you know, we maybe harvested a third to a half of the tomatoes off of just the first cluster that, that had turned and were ripen, ripening. And um, yeah, we're going to need to, uh, I think we're getting ready to purchase some more uh, crates to hold the tomatoes in because when this tunnel gets, when it kicks in and we have our really big harvest in another two or three weeks, um, we'll be crying tomatoes. I don't know. We're going to have a lot of tomatoes. But it's exciting. I mean, we're, I'm, ha I'm happy with, with the crop so far and, and how the trial's turning out. So. And I just threw this picture in just as an example. When we do harvest, um, and you know, this was from plot four, which uh, that variety was red snapper. And these are the number ones uh, that I pulled uh, off of that plot. So, you know, from four plants, you know, just this first harvest walking through, you know, we had six number ones and it looks like they weighed about 3.7 pounds. So, and you can see the stem scar on this one isn't, it's a little bit large. It's not, it's not, it's not horribly ugly. Um, so you're just kind of talking about this stem scar yeah. right here. Yeah. Um, a lot of time, you know, that's um, when you get the really, the really thin, small stem scar, sometimes folk, you know, your, your customers may be like, are those hothouse tomatoes? You know, it's mm -hmm. these with a little bit larger scar, they feel like they're more of the, they have a, a homegrown, you know, home garden look so interesting huh um and you know these this looks like on, as far as the shoulders on this one uh, looks pretty smooth so remind us again uh for those that haven't graded tomatoes what is how are you defining a number one just for so uh, number one listeners. grade needs to weigh um eight ounces or more and there needs to be no blemishes on it so you see there's no cracking um, around the stem there's no zippering um, so zippering is when we have a you know something happens during pollination and we'll get like a, a a kind of a scarred line that'll run down from the from the stem to the blossom end um, sometimes those can be wide sometimes they're just a little uh, thin thin line where just one pollen tube got messed up um, there's no blossom in rots on this I mean so they're really high quality grade us grade one would be highest quality on the on the tomato and then when we go to a a uh, number two uh, those are still we would still consider those marketable but they may have a very small crack starting um at the stem it wouldn't be very deep um it, uh, if anything is a very deep scar then we would count that as a cull now you know as we're selling to, you know, as you're selling on a roadside stand, not into a wholesale market, but into a retail market, you know, I think you can, um, knowing your customer, I think that your customers, I think you can withstand a little, a few more blemishes, mm. a few, a few cracks that are not going to be open and, and invite disease in, but just some, some small cracks and your customers are fine with that. And, you know, even the ones, um, that I would consider a cull, I think we have a lot of growers that will sell those as canners, um, you know, at a reduced price so that you did already go through the time of, of harvesting them, bring them in, at least get a recoup a little bit of money out of them. Um, you know, and you'll have, you'll always have customers that, that will want to buy canners. So, um, but yeah, that's, um, that's kind of what we're looking at on a number one versus a number two. All right, so I just threw these two pictures in. Um, the picture on the left would be um, 
a tomato plant that's got that has got white mold on it and um, so that's a you know the stem will be rotting and we'll see the white fuzz on the outside and it, um, if we were to to cut that open we would see some some small black um, kind of elongated tiny pebble looking things in the stem those are the uh, the sclerotia and within this issue of the newsletter uh, so our June issue of the newsletter Dr. Babadus has put in an article on white mold on tomatoes and so there's a lot of description on that disease um, you know what that looks like management control things like that so I definitely recommend if anybody is is seeing symptoms like this in your tomatoes uh, to, to read Dr. Babadu's article on that and, and if you have more questions to contact him on how to control that. Um, I think we have called out six plants from our variety trial uh, tunnel that showed these symptoms. Um, as soon as we see it, we carefully um, extract the plant out and pull it up out of the ground. Uh, we don't want that stem to open up and uh, release any of those sclerotia into the soil because then it will um, be there for the next the, the following season and so you know we're actually handling handling those with gloves um, any of the tools printing tools that we use we're sanitizing those after use we are putting it in a garbage bag and getting it out of there I don't I wouldn't want to put this in my compost pile um, at all and Luckily, when we when we start to see those symptoms and we call those out, I don't see it's it's not something that necessarily spreads from plant to plant like a bacterial disease would. Um, but I still want to get that out um, and hopefully keep the soil as clean as possible for further seasons. So, again, there's an article in the in this week's or this month's newsletter um, from Dr. Babadus on this with um, all of the information that you need for that that particular disease. Did you see this last year with any uh, tomatoes you were growing, or is this just a, just a little bit? It's nothing that's been. It's I haven't seen anything that's been alarming where it's a large section of the tunnel, um, mm -hmm. and I almost wish that it would happen in like you know in a ten foot section, but it's like a plant in one row and then two rows over in another section. It will be oh, one plant, goodness. and so. That's kind of got me scratching my head just a little bit, like how did that get introduced? Um, mm -hmm. And so we'll just kind of have to see, you know, what what it looks like next season. You know, if we see a higher incidence of it, or if it's, you know, I don't, I don't know. Um, it's kind of kind of interesting, but it is, you know, if we do see this, the plant's not going to outgrow this. This isn't something that, you know, it will wilt down and 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 die. So. Mm, okay it's not it's not like well if i hang on maybe i can get it harvest a little bit of fruit off of it and save a little bit from the plant it, it won't it'll wilt down and you need to you need to get it taken out right away and then the other picture on the right um just snap that um that's kind of magnesium deficiency symptoms we see that on the, on our lower leaves where we have the yellowing um between the veins on the leaves and, uh, you know, we just, we have corrected that with a little, adding a little Epsom salt into our, as we fertigate. Uh, I think uh, some of the recommendations that we see, I don't know, like two tablespoons per gallon if you were treating individual plants. But for us in our height tunnel, we probably mix up about a pound. Um, and then that spread through, that's run through the drip for the, across the whole tunnel. Uh, we don't want to put on a lot because then you run into um, starting to get a, a pretty big imbalance between your magnesium and your calcium. Um, and so we, we want to hold that balance. But, you know, we start to see start to see these symptoms on the lower leaves and we make an application and, you know, I'm not seeing it further up the plant. It's not moving up the plant at all. So I think, you know, that tells me that the plant was able to take that up and, and correct the, the slight deficiency that it had. Okay, so these are just a few pictures of some of the insect releases that we've been doing. Um, uh, 
with the biological control. So the picture on the left would be a pepper plant that is just engulfed in aphids in our uh, hydroponic tunnel. And for that tunnel, we do do the monthly timed releases of the three, the three um, predators that I mentioned. But we also, for that one, we do the equivalent of a spot spray. So if we were using insecticides and within a tunnel, we saw we had a pocket where we had just super heavy aphid infestation. You know, I could maybe go in with an insecticide that was labeled and, and just kind of spray those two or three plants that may be in that pocket and not need to necessarily spray the whole tunnel. Um, we're kind of using some prescribed insect releases in that same sense. So almost a spot spray, a spot release of insects. And so um, Dr. Athey had ordered us uh, a parasitic wasp that's uh, specific for, for aphids. And so that picture in the middle, you see they came in a little bit of a, like a sawdust media and um, yeah, so there's, there's one of the little, yeah, one of the little creatures there. And so, um, I kind of made some trays that we hung on the, on plants and just kind of sprinkled a few of those in each. Uh, and I think I, we spot, spot released in about three or four sections and, um, those were pretty actively moving, um, I don't think they were in my little plastic tray very long before they were up in 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 the plant and and uh, obviously they had plenty of food source resource there so uh, hopefully they're not flying away hopefully they're sticking around and and uh, creating little aphid mummies as dr athy likes to say um, then the other two pictures um again the 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 one that says the bio percy plus um, that is a predator, predatory mite that is very sp specific to two-spotted spider mite. And our strawberries, which would be in the bottom picture, there we're starting to see spider mite populations increase. Um, the top left corner of those strawberries, we start to see a little bit of brown. Uh, leaves are turning a little bit brownish, and there's webbing in there. So our our population of spider mites is starting to build. So we're going to spot release for those. Um, and then I think the the uh, other part of the picture, um, besides the the, uh, the the sachet for the predator mite is the one for the uh, lacewing larva. Or no, it may be the aureus. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's the aureus. So that's the the container for the that minute pirate bug. So anyway, that's just wanted to include some of those pictures and kind of talk about that kind of the the spot release on the insects um, as opposed to the 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 timed release once a month. Thanks for sharing. It's always uh, it's always nice to see what's going on at Dixon Springs, especially as <laughs> where some of us aren't based at research facilities in the state. So it's you know it's always fascinating to see. Um, where you all are at with your your research for the summer. Mm -hmm. um, so Nathan, you're working in pumpkins right now, right? Is that correct? So yeah, it's uh, no, we are we are working on getting pumpkins out. So we're going to have a, a pumpkin field day in Southern Illinois on September 1st. We're partnering with Eckert's Orchard. And so that's um, we're have a host site there. We have uh, some trials out there. I was actually out there this morning doing a few things. We're going to be transplanting out our variety trial, um, hopefully next week, doing some coordinating with the grower. As far as that, we have, we're, as in the past, we have, are going to be no-till transplanting uh, most of the trials and every, or the variety trial especially. Mm -hmm. And so we're uh, looking forward to getting those out in the field next week. We're going to have a few um, a few plots with some different uh, tillage systems and herbicide treatments, kind of looking at overall weed management uh, perspectives um, as well, along with, uh, you know, lots of other, of course, information we'll include through the field day. So I think, Bronwyn, I got a little crazy. I think I cut it off. We had, I have 88 pumpkin and oh, gourd varieties. Wow. So. <laughs> yeah, I thought you were... Wasn't new, it like at 75 the here. last field day? 
it was i think i may have hit it was in 75 or, or even 80 we, we were fortunate i guess maybe in, a, in from a certain perspective is that the last the 2020 field day uh we were at the siu bevo research center and we had just incredible rain and so one area that had gourds and other things actually just completely drowned it out we had mm. like I want to say it was like 19 inches of rain within a month and a half after planting. It was crazy. Um, so, so that that part of it. So, so that only left us 54 varieties in the other field. The other, like I want to say, it was maybe around 82 total. But this is 88 is definitely the what, kind of the. Why personal... did you stop there? Why don't you just make it an even 100? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I I thought about it, <laughs> and then a little voice from a colleague said don't make it any bigger than that uh, 80 used to be my my weakness and or my kind of my threshold and then you go through and then you know as we're collecting seeds and gathering entries from companies like oh i want to see this and oh this is out and it's just it's kind of hard to um to kind of make that um make some of those calls so i did a little uh, little soul searching and measuring on the maps and plot layout and and decided that that was at least in theory, if everything works like the math says, that was my happy spot, and I do have to stop whenever I hit to 88. That was getting close to a happy spot, so we gotta gotta cut it off, or we're just gonna run out of space. So, are there any um for the ones that you're growing? Are there any kind of new emerging features this year that seem a little bit different than previous pumpkin research days? That you've um. Used? I think, um, you know, from what, from some of those perspectives we have, I can tell the industry has shifted toward, is certainly continuing to shift towards like the specialty pumpkin market. And we have, you know, have had uh, a couple of, of, of breeding companies that have some new entries in some of the specialty pumpkins and looking at, so things other than orange. Um, so it'll be inter interesting to see how the, uh, how those traits and of that they have how those pan out how consistent they are the quality consistency those are always the things that i look for um and so it'll be interesting to see definitely there's a few new things that i'm very i'm very intrigued about some some let's just say that on paper some traits that i haven't seen in some especially pumpkins so we'll oh, see we'll see if they uh we'll see how they do in uh, in the real world so and in, in our area and see if they perform you know as well as they do in other other areas so um but i think there's some promise certainly always new jack-o-lantern varieties um and um you know smaller gourds the pie size you know any of those anywhere from you know kind of the the two to six or even eight pound sized um pumpkins you know certainly um lots in there and so yeah there'd be be a little bit of hopefully a little bit of something for everyone there so that's um this will be, as I looked back in our, my memories, this will be the fifth pumpkin field day in my tenure with Extension anyhow. And so we'll, uh, um, and there's some things that, uh, yeah, I think it'll be good. It'll be nice. Definitely the variety trial is a little bigger. I don't remember where the first one was. I want to say it was still around 50 or so, even the very first year, and it quickly kind of expanded. But it's, uh, but no, I think, I think this will be good. We're really happy this first year to partner on on farm with a grower, and so yeah. I think that'll be a nice uh, nice partnership. And certainly they're a, a great facility to visit, and we'll get to hear a little bit about even their their production system as well, in addition to other um, you know uh, research presentations from you know uh, Dr. Bob Adust and, and and Dr. Athey and other researchers. So, well, and, you know, Eckers just hosted the summer horse field day, isn't that correct? That's correct, yeah. Yeah, because I know the broad one, you attended it, right? Yeah, I was there. Um, Elizabeth, I think Elizabeth Wally was there. Um, as far as just thinking about um, some of our, edu our uh, educators that would have been there. Yeah, because yeah, I, so I wasn't able to attend it, but I know that you took a couple of photos of, of their, their, uh, small fruits yeah so the the photo on the left um my my favorite fruit ever is a black raspberry and um the eckert's the eckert farm they are they've been growing blackberries on a rotating trellis arm for a number of years and um they have added uh, a variety 
maybe two varieties of black raspberries on the rotating trellis arm. And so I was really excited to see that. And um, they had just started to ripen. So, you know, got off the wagon and kind of milled through and were sampling. And um, it was just, you know, the, the trellis arm, that rotating trellis arm system is just so amazing. I mean, yeah. there's, you know, there's a lot of input costs to it and, um, you know, quite a bit of, of labor to, you know, make those rotations and, and, you know, training on the different training, the canes on the different arms and the, and the uh, wire. But man, when you see the, that ripe fruit just hanging, you know, at this angle and it's just this wall, solid wall of fruit. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really impressive. It's, it's pretty, pretty uh, from a UPIC standpoint, it, it, it's, consumer focused right. way of growing that you just can't as much as you share the labor the fiscal input there's a good trade-off chris i think chris eckert i i believe i don't want to misquote him but i believe he felt like with their you pick in that system that they're able to harvest about 95 percent of the crop um with the you pick and yeah. i mean the customers just love it yeah, you know, mm -hmm. there's no bending over. You're kind of in the shade. It's literally at head and shoulder height, um, so it's a really efficient way to harvest. Um, and, and with with the you know, it's also providing shade, some shade onto that those fruit crops that you know uh, are pretty delicate, especially a black raspberry. You know, they'll hold up a lot better if they can be in a little bit of shade instead of that as far as the fruit crumbling um mm -hmm. and so that this system kind of affords that so it was, it was pretty interesting and then the middle picture they were they had just finished up their last harvest on their uh, plastic culture strawberries for the season on their june bearers and so that was this was probably the first week of june it was June the 9th was okay. Summer Hort Field Day, yeah. Because we up north, we're about to end our our June bearing strawberry season probably this week. So that gives you a, kind of a time frame of like, we're probably three weeks in most years behind you all. Mm -hmm. and, and then the, the picture on the right, uh, just one I snapped of some of their, their field tomatoes on, you know, they've got on the black plastic and the staked and, uh, you know, they've got a some grass in their walkways there. So, you know, that's good when you're going through to harvest that you're not walking through mud as we would all like to see a little bit of rain and a little bit of mud out there wouldn't be a necessarily a bad thing at this point and benefit a lot of, a lot of the crops. But um, I, you know, I meant to snap a picture and I didn't do it. Um, you know, a big focus during summer Horton day was on their high density apple plantings and kind of some of the, the trellising system that they're using, um, some of the varieties that they're looking at. They also had some um, netting that they were putting over oh, the crop, uh, whole sections or rows of, of the trees um, to uh, kind of act as a shade cloth. Um, I think they were looking at, you know, Honeycrisp can be one for us in Southern Illinois that can sunburn pretty easy. And so they're looking at ways to kind of help prevent that um, because customers obviously love Honeycrisp apples. And so right. if you can, you know, do the things that modify the things that we need to do here to, to, to have a, a more successful crop of those, they want to try to do that. So, yeah, but yeah, no, it was a, I really enjoyed the tours. Um, Eckers is, is a phenomenal facility and uh, they're always gracious to host, host meetings and, um, I think they always have worked with extension and the university really well. And um, it's just really neat to see all the stuff that they're doing at their farm. Well, and Nathan, with them being a research partner on your, your pumpkin field day, what, you know, as, as we think about, you know, if we don't have access to a research facility, we're partnering with farmers to do University of Illinois research on their farm. That's, that's what I'm doing up north. So as you look at that partnership with Eckerd for Pumpkin Field Day, are there certain tasks that they are kind of overseeing and you're overseeing other things? 
So yeah, we're um, for us at least in in my scenario there they've um, you know they've helped us out like uh, last fall I said all right I want um, uh, you know I want to make sure that we have um, uh, some cereal rye planted I said you know they don't traditionally do a lot of no-till but I said well here's here's kind of like my general kind of grower caveat say for this specific thing if we're going to do this I said we've We've always done it no-till transplanted and kind of just used that as our production system. You know, I feel like it's got a big place and I feel like we, you know, in extension and through research, we should be using, you know, what we feel is like a like a the best or very viable production system in our trials. If we're, you know, if we want to promote that, then you know, doing trials like this in those systems, you know aligns people in that mindset versus saying oh we'll just do a conventional tillage trial and you know then we're not you know we want to kind of align our missions and conservation and things so you know they did that for me um uh in this case they have they're going to put down for like the variety trial area they're going to put down like a, a blanket herbicide application that we need for that so that's um so they're going to take care of that and they're also going to help with the uh, um uh, you know, like the maintenance sprays, insecticide, fungicides as needed later in the season. Um, so we're going to go, we will do all the planting. Um, the, the cereal rye, I actually, I actually went out and did the roller crimping part. I brought a roller crimper um, and then uh, was able to use one of their tractors and do that part. So that was one of the kind of things, same way we'll bring, uh, we have planting equipment, um, you know, no-till transplanter or, you know, no-till seeder for some direct seed and stuff, uh, planter. And so, um, I'll bring equipment that we have and then, you know, they'll have a tractor on site. So it saves some transportation and other logistics that, um, and, and so it does, I see the biggest thing with that in, in any relationship and I try to build is, you know, just getting, you know, having worked with, you know, a farm and a grower. So you have kind of a trusted relationship on that, um, you know, both directions. So that way they know that I, you know, everything I'm doing is, you know, on the, you know, the best, the up and up and try and, you know, try to lay out straightforward, um, you know, best ways to communicate and things. And, and uh, you know, um, certainly there's always things that come up, um, you know, and just they're an extremely busy operation. So um, I try to be as gracious uh, as possible. Like earlier today, whenever I asked nicely, it's like, I really do need this pre-emergent herbicide sprayed here soon ish um and so uh so that's uh, and certainly you know we both know you know we both know that we have lots going on and they're, they're really good about you know trying to accommodate it i'm also saying i need this done you know you have a business to run and you're happy to support so as much as i may or may not be in a you know in a hurry whatever it may be um i also know that I appreciate you getting this done whenever you can, you know, and maybe giving it some level of priority in the grand scheme of things, you know. Uh, but no, I I think um, you know that's some of the key things, and uh, I it's always good to have a any grower relation grower research project is like trying to have a relationship with a grower and then building on that into it versus just say looking through you know oh here's a grower, let's just call them and see if we can do a trial on this place, which I think we've had a few incidents like that in our past. And they, they can work, um, always interesting experiences and stories to come from any any research trial on farm or on station. But um, but I think having that relationship and, and understanding their management system and saying, and, and trying to make sure you're on the same wavelength um, you know, I know that a lot of as far as the crop maintenance and things, I know kind of their general system and what they're doing and, and I'm, I'm very comfortable if they, you know, they're able to, you know, provide and, you know, I'm not concerned about them, their ability to be able to say, you know, help protect the crop as best as we can, you know, uh, from, you know, any kind of pest and things like that. Because obviously, you know, for the sake of a variety trial, we do want, um, you know, we want to have, a, you know, a healthy crop to be able to show everyone in September. Right. So um, just a lot of, a lot of things that we, we balance. And I think it just all goes back to that communication and relationship um, kind of from the start and, and throughout. So. 
Yeah, because that's, um, you know, with the, the strawberry research I'm doing up in northern Illinois, it, it is, you know, it's the, that relationship development with the growers is, is what we really aimed for. Um, with this day neutral strawberry production uh, research, um, we just to kind of share, share what we've been doing. Um, they were planted the first week of May at two different sites, two different farms. One farm is a mixed vegetable CSA that is um, overseen by Freeport High School's vegetable program. So high school students are overseeing the University of Illinois strawberry research, which is just a wonderful collaboration and partnership. And then the same varieties are being grown at Terrapin Orchards, which is in Joe Davis. And Terrapin Orchards is a strawberry you pick operation, uh, apple orchard as well. Um, and they do some other uh, fruits too. Um, so both are growing the same varieties, but both are growing them in um, kind of in the way that makes the most sense for them. So one is plastic culture, drip irrigation, and just another couple of rows with their mixed vegetable operation at Freeport. And then the other one is they do you pick without any irrigation. Um, and so the strawberries are being grown uh, without irrigation at that facility. Um, so the first six weeks with day neutrals, because we're growing them as an annual strawberry, it's a focus on removing any flowers that develop. And then after the first six weeks, we allow the flowers to develop. Um, and then the weekly task right now is really a lot of runner removal because we're just going to, we're, get, we're losing energy. We've got to send the energy back to the root um, and leaf development. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. I mean, it, it is, it's certainly uh, the first year of it. Uh, we're, I'm seeing a little bit of noticeable differences um, in varieties that are unirrigated, at least at this point. Um, the three varieties that we are looking at are, are Albion, Seascape, and Merit de Bois. Um, Seascape, Albion, pretty common ones. The Merit de Bois, um, I, that's that's the one that um, you don't see as often. Um, have have you have you grown Merit de Bois? Yeah, I, I see you shaking your head, bra one. Um, yeah, that's the one that was a a last minute addition. So we'll we'll kind of see how it looks. Um, what I can kind of say so far is that the irrigated one might be two weeks ahead as far as yields. I think we're still aiming for mid-August harvest um, is what we're aiming for. And I think we're gonna get there um, with it. But you know, so far they, they're they doing pretty pretty well um, and, and, and are getting to where they need to be so far too. Um, and it should, should be stated that we don't necessarily see the day neutrals replacing June bearing but it could be the complement to the orchards in the fall or the pumpkins in the fall is that you have strawberry you pick as they're coming out there. Um, certainly, I think there's a lot of enthusiasm for these to complement mixed vegetable CSA or mixed vegetable farm. Having weekly strawberries in your CSA box from mid-August to end of, end of October, I think is pretty appealing. Um, and it is potentially avoiding this June period where it's just unpredictable weather at this point. Yeah, I think this is an I think it's an interesting project. I'm mm -hmm. definitely looking forward to hearing how it how it goes over the next couple of years. And um, I think if you can figure out a way to hit a hit a little bit different market time, I think that's that's really great. Yeah, I think that's what I mean. That's there's a lot some high tunnel. I mean, Brahman, you guys, that's a lot of what you've done in various aspects of of that. So yeah, being able to take that to the field, I mean, high tunnels are great, but I think there's still lots of not when you know there's lots of non high tunnel opportunities and th ways we can think outside the box too. So I guess one thing I would kind of just in summing up some of this, I think Grant, you would agree, is just. It's from, a, I guess, our perspective, for any growers listening, if you're ever interested in hosting research, you know, know that, you know, certainly, a, you know, one of my things, I try to be really conscious of a grower's, you know, like their system and setup, but there are going to be some things, some of which seem even a little bit crazy that we, A, maybe want you to do, or or some 
you know, some things like I had to do some work today, say, all right, I don't want any herbicide sprayed on this quarter of the field that has these flags. So, you know, when, you know, because we're going to put out a herbicide trial, we'll hand spray and lay things out. So it's just trying to be, you know, really clear. And also we try to, so I said, all right, this is a block on the south quarter of this field. Don't spray south of any orange flags, you know, versus sometimes in a research farm, we'll stick a little something over in this corner and here, you know, trying to say, all right, we're not going to do 20 different pumpkin trials on this area. We're going to have a big variety trial. We're going to take a block and we're going to do some kind of integrated management trial that's pretty simple and straightforward. Um, and so just, I guess, always just know if you're looking to come in, you know, if you're interested in partnering with, with anyone in, whether it be us or even another, you know, university type setting, you just know that there's these little, little aspects that that may at some time seem minor, but to us can be sometimes really major and maybe like a, maybe like a critical part of, you know, of a, of a core aspect we're testing and, you know, really necessary to give us some of that information. So um, sometimes I even get kind of overrun with the different level of details of whether it be, you know, plant populations or how we plant or, you know, the herbicide or insecticide treatments, all of those things can um can can make certainly a huge difference so right right exactly and and I, I think you know especially as we we look at this some of our research we're doing some you know things that we wouldn't necessarily be doing or grow or wouldn't be doing and yet we we need to know like you know how many hours it took to plant the strawberries or you know when I'm weeding some of these plots I set a timer on my phone to kind of understand what the hand labor is going to be on a weekly basis that you know a grower might look at it and be like oh, I've got a weed issue I'm just going to spray an herbicide and move on from it and yet we need to know the minutia of these so we can be at the right stage of recommending or not recommending Folks, uh, any final thoughts to kind of wrap up our, our June 2022 edition of the Illinois Fruit and Vegetable Newsletter, or the deeper dig, if you will, into this month's issue? No, I hope um, I hope if we get together next month, we have some uh, some pumpkin pictures and some updates and all the, the planting and everything that will transpire for field day. And so, yeah, other than that, that's... Uh, that's going to be what I'm going to be preoccupied with for about the next probably 10 days or so of my life. So <laughs> Brahman has tomatoes. I have yes. strawberries in the field with no strawberries. Nathan just has pumpkin plants without pumpkins. <laughs> yes. 88 varieties worth. Well, oh, true, true, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for joining us today for the deeper dig of the Illinois Fruit and Vegetable Newsletter for the June 2022 edition. You can find this month's issue by visiting extension.illinois.edu slash specialty dash crops dash IFVN, which will be on your screen below, and where you can further be added to the email list to receive the newsletter. We look forward to you joining us next month for a more of a deeper dig into next month's newsletter. Thank you.